turn this on. There we go. I know I turned it on. Um, it's so good to be here with you all today. We've been away for a while, um, and I just wanted to give you a small report of where we've been. We've had such a wonderful time these past few uh, weeks, these past couple of weeks. Um, a few of you knew that we, that we were going to Israel, Danny and myself, we were going to Israel. We've spent about a week and a half there, nine days, and I just wanted to show you some of the things that we learned there, some of the places that we went. Now, my wife put these pictures together, and she has a way better memory than I do <laughs> about, uh, about, well, everything, you know. She has better memory than I do just about everything. Um, so if I don't remember one of the places or another, we're going to go through this quick, but I just wanted to show you guys and tell you that it's a very worthwhile trip. So that's, um, that's when we get to the airport in, uh, in Israel, um, right there. That's actually a, a public bathroom um, at the amphitheater that you find in Caesarea where that Herod the Great built. And that was just a public bathroom. People would just, yeah, go to the bathroom in front of everybody. That's a real public bathroom. Okay, and, <laughs> and so I was sitting on the throne, but <laughs> underneath that they, had, they used to have a stream that used to take the waste away, but not anymore. Um, we loved, uh, we loved going to Caesarea and, and seeing just what, uh, where Jesus walked, you know. We saw the, the room where Paul, the Apostle Paul, was brought um, before Herod and before um, uh, Festus. Um, it, w- it, was, it was incredible to see that happening. It's right on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, that's looking down from, the, from Mount Carmel, if I'm not mistaken. And I have my, my big Texas cowboy hat on. And, uh, and, and just, just to mention something, we have some friends from Texas, from our church in Texas, visiting us here. It's Bill and Don. They're right next to, to Danny. So if you guys have a chance to say hi to them later on today, they're visiting us all the way from Texas, um, from the city of Beaumont. Has anyone heard Beaum- about Beaumont, Texas this past week? It's been flooded. Um, it was just flooded. It was the center of, uh, I think it was Tropical Depression in Melda. And so it's flooded. So please, please pray for Beaumont. Please pray for our, our home church there. But in any case, that's where I got that, that hat, that cowboy hat. And so I used that on the first day. And here we're looking down on the Valley of Megiddo from atop the, the, the Mount Carmel. And if you've ever heard of Armageddon, that's where that word will come from, so from the Valley of Megiddo. Um, that is the view from the Sea of Galilee. And here's an amazing fact for you. I didn't know, I didn't know this, but the Sea of Galilee is nothing more than a lake. It's really a lake. It's smaller than Lake Tahoe. And uh, it's a beautiful lake, um, but they call it the Sea of Galilee. But here's another fact. They have waves there that can, get up, that can be up to 15 feet high on a lake. So you can really imagine, you know, a storm and Jesus atop on the hillside looking down at the disciples in the middle of that storm, you know, um, because they, they do have very high waves because wind comes rushing in. And so it, there are very nasty storms there. This is in Capernaum. Danny? Capernaum. Okay. These are some ruins in Capernaum. Um, this is around where they, they say that Peter's house was at. We're, we're not really sure where his house was, but this is close to where they say it was. Um, this is looking down from the Mount of the Beatitudes where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And we had one young man there that was with our group, and he recited the whole Sermon on the Mount by memory. And it was beautiful, you know. He did it beautifully. And we were able to, uh, to kind of envision Jesus preaching that sermon from the place where, you know, where it was preached. And that was a very beautiful experience. This is, the, this is in the ruins of the city called Tel Dan. Um, and this, this was the gate, of the, the gate of the city. So if you remember back the story of Boaz and Ruth, um, at the end when he, when he claims her, you know, um, in the before the the judges, the elders of the city, because he's her kinsman redeemer, this is kind of a place where that could have happened. That's what they'll tell you there. We're not sure that this was it, but this is one of the places where they expect this could have happened, and this was the the gate to that that town of Tel Den. This is the view from, from the Mount of the Transfiguration, okay? So this is where they say that Jesus was, you know, he was uh, glorified, in front of his of those three disciples, Peter, John, and James, and uh, here we have, uh, I think it's close to Gilboa. This is where Gideon separated his three hundred. This was the pool, 
We went to the actual pool. It's a very nice pool, and uh, it's very, uh, the water is very clean, and that's where they say that Gideon separated, you know, that's where you have the division of the 300 men of Gideon, the ones that drank water like dogs that lapped it up and others that brought it up to their mouth. So I was able to lap up. <laughs> I, I would be one of the ones that was lapping up the water. I don't know how, how careful I'd be if I was that thirsty. This is the River Jordan. And we had actually people in our group that were baptized there. And um, yeah, I, I, I had that Pathfinder hat on. It was the end of the day. I was already dead tired. I wanted to go back to the hotel. But we had to take a picture at the Jordan River. And, uh, and, and that's where we were at that, that moment. This, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not Danny and myself on the, on the, on the le- right-hand side, okay? That's not me. <laughs> I'm on the left-hand side, and I have a, a scroll. that We were, at, there's actually only one live replica of what a, um, a synagogue was like in Jesus' days. There's only one in the Holy Land, and uh, that's where we are right there. We're in this, in this um, authentic village where people actually dress up like um, people in Jesus' day. So you had Abraham dressed up, and you had Mary dressed up, and Joseph dressed up, and they showed us a wine press and an oil press, and it was a very interesting, very interesting trip. That is at Jericho. We were at the excavation of Jericho. Um, I'll tell you something. I thought it was bigger. I thought it'd be bigger. You know, they talk about Jericho. I thought it would be bigger, but it was actually a fortress. And they say it's the oldest city in the world. So uh, that's, those are the ruins, you know, the excavations of the city of, of Jericho. And then there was someone there. I got kind of jealous. There was someone that wanted to give Danny a kiss. You can imagine that after that, I didn't want to kiss her. She had bad breath after that. <laughs> but yeah, Danny had some adventures there too. Um, no one offered to buy her for camels, though. That's happened to a few friends of ours. No one, no one offered to buy her. It was, it was interesting. That was at the Temple Mount. So we have the Temple, the temple Dome the, uh, right up there. That's a mosque where the temple in Jesus' day was. Right? So this is the temple complex, but today we have, we have a mosque up there. They, used, they say that the temple was actually two times the height of that mosque. So you can imagine that it was a huge building. It was a magnificent building. No wonder the disciples, they couldn't imagine not one stone remaining on top of each other, you know, because it was such a magnificent complex. Um, And that right there is where they say the altar of sacrifice was. That's where most of the scholars agree that the, the altar of incense was. This is the view from atop of Masada. Have you guys ever heard of Masada? Masada was where um, the, the Jewish zealots in the second century, they, they kind of took over the, Herod's um, fortress. And uh, the Roman, five Roman legions, about 25,000 men came to take it back from them. And they, they couldn't find a way in, so they, built, they literally built a ramp to get to the top part of the mountain. Right? So that's, you can imagine how, how, that's why the Roman Empire was so great. They couldn't get up in the mountain in the normal way, so let's just build a ramp. Right? But when they got there, everyone was dead. The Jews had decided that they didn't want to live in bondage, so they killed themselves um, rather than be slaves. It's a, it's a very sad story. This is the view. If you can look right there, that's where one of the legions would stay. And this line here was the, the siege line, so they'd have sentries looking so that no one could escape. And they had, multi- they had about eight of these, uh, of these squares all around the, all around the, the plateau, all around the mountain. Um, so there's, there's Danny. That's the most beautiful thing out there, all right? My wife. And behind her, that's Cave 4 of Qumran. This is one of the caves where they found the manuscripts of the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was Cave Number 4. So that's us at Qumran. They found a village there, and, you know, they learned a little bit about how those, the Essenes lived and how those people that copied the text lived. It was really interesting. Um, oh, there we go. That's me just chilling <laughs> in, the, in the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely one place that you got to go. It, it will make you float. You will float, okay? It's really hard to stand up. I, I didn't really believe it before I went, but it's hard for you to stand up. It either The sea either wants you to be on your back or on your stomach. It's really hard to stand up there. But I, I didn't manage to stay there for more than five minutes because the water burns, and it burns everything. So I was, I, I left in like five minutes because <laughs> I was all burning up. Um, but it was a really interesting experience. That, that was really cool. I love that part. Um, why am I going back? There we go. This is a replica of the city of Jerusalem from Jesus' day 
that they have at the Qumran Museum. This is the museum where they keep the manuscripts of the Dead Sea. And outside they have this huge model of what, you know, uh, of what Jerusalem was in Jesus' day. So you can just see how big the temple was. Because look, this is the city right here, the houses and all that. And this is the temple. The temple was massive. Actually, when King Herod amplified it during the third temple period, um, it was the largest built complex in the Roman Empire. So that was, you know, it's massive. It was huge. That's why the Jews were so uh, proud of their temple, you know, because it was this massive masterpiece of human construction. Um, this is the Wailing Wall. I was on the other side of that because they divide. This is where they separate the, the women from the men. So that's Danny. She was our official photographer there. If, if I were taking the, the pictures, you'd have no pictures because I'm not good at that. But uh, so this is the Wailing Wall, um, the, the, the Wall of Lament. Uh, it's a very interesting experience being there, you know, because you see many of the, many of the locals, they're there, they're crying, they're reading the Bible, they're having their worship, and then you'll have tourists in their face taking pictures and making videos. I, it was very curious to see. Um, this is the view from the Mount of Olives. All right, so this is the view. So when Jesus says how, you know, when Jesus, he, he, he cries over Jerusalem and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have desired to, to tuck you under my wings as a mother hen tucks her chicks under her wings. This is the view that Jesus had of Jerusalem. Of course, there's, you know, there's a lot of, this isn't exactly, and there are a lot of things have been, re Jerusalem has been rebuilt more than 22 times. So, you know, they destroyed it and rebuilt it and destroyed it and rebuilt it. So it's really hard to say exactly where anything was, but this is the Mount of Olives. So somewhere over there, Jesus, Jesus was crying over Jerusalem. Is that it? This is the Valley of Elah, where David fought Goliath. So this is a river, this is a river bread, uh, riverbed, actually, where uh, the tourists, they go and they, uh, they get stones because this is where David, traditionally, David, he got the stones to kill Goliath. I really think that every night the locals come, they dump more rocks there because after so many years of people getting rocks, I don't think any rocks would be left. So I really think someone comes and dumps new rocks. But I, I, like a good tourist that I am, I got some rocks. Um, and we'll be, in one of my children's story, we'll be using one of those rocks and maybe giving it to one of the kids if they're good. And I think that's it, that's it. So I just wanted to show you guys what we've been up to these past um, couple of weeks. It's been a great trip, but I'll tell you something. It is so good to be home. <laughs> It is so good to be home. It's good to see you guys. It's good to be at church. It's good to, we were able to see, um, we, were, we spent one afternoon with our home church in Beaumont um, before the rain came. So we left and the, right, right, the very next day it started raining. So God was good. God was good to us. And we've been asking for him to protect and to be with our, our friends there in Beaumont. But that's where we've been, okay? Um, if you have any questions, ask Danny. She knows it all. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> okay? So before we, we begin our, our, our message this morning, let's say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love, for your blessings. Please be with us um, through this moment right, right now, this message that we have. Lord, please um, use me. Open your word, Lord, and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we, the, the, the clip, the PowerPoint goes on. I, yeah. So if you could just put the PowerPoint back, Brian. Um, a few weeks back, a few weeks back, Pastor Doug, he preached a sermon on Ephesians chapter 6. How many of you remember that? The armor of God. That was the title of his sermon. And that sermon is a powerful sermon. That's a very powerful text. I think I have to go a little bit, a, a little bit closer to the, uh, to the chip for this thing to work. But, um, that sermon was so powerful and I love that text so much. And Pastor Doug just did it in this amazing presentation that day that I decided that day, I told Danny, if I get the chance to preach in the following weeks, I'm going to preach about that text too because I love it. So I'm going to go at it from a different perspective, but I think it, it complements a little bit about what Pastor Doug was talking about that day. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. The, I, I decided to change the name of the sermon. Here it's the Christian's armor. In the bulletin you'll see it, an, a soldier's armor, but it's all God's armor. It's really about God's armor and how he provides for us. The text that we read from is from Ephesians 6, 14 through 17, where we read, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, a few years ago, um, I was reading about the composition of the different hymn books that we have in different denominations. You know, every church, every different church has a hymn book. You know, most Protestant churches, they have a hymn book. And I was reading about a particular um, evangelical denomination and how they, uh, they assembled their songs. And it's really interesting that they, they put a t committee together you know, to decide which songs would, would stay, which songs would be out, what, if they would introduce any new songs. And that committee got into a little spat. They started, they had a pretty, actually they had a pretty feisty argument over one song. Guess which one? Onward Christian Soldiers. You know why? Because a few of them thought that that was you know, a very well-loved song. It should be in. It's a very traditional Christian song. It has a, a great melody, a great, you know, lyrics. It's a great song to put in. But some others didn't like the fact that it, it was talking about war. They didn't like that it, it sounded like a very aggressive, kind of violent hymn, and they didn't think that it, you know, it fit with a Christian hymnal. And so they got into this argument about if this song should be considered in their hymnal. Now, when I was reading this, I was thinking, well, if they're talking about one song, I can't imagine what they have to say about the Bible, especially the Old Testament. The Old Testament is littered with everywhere with stories of battle, of wars, and, and you have uh, skirmishes and combat. The Old Testament and the New Testament, they're full of, of references and mentions of war, of combat, of warfare. Listen to this, for example. The Apostle Paul, he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. That's, he, he's warning the Ephesians of this. And then he goes on to talk about a shield and a belt and a sword and a breastplate. So the question is, why do you think it was important to these apostles? Why do you think it's important for the Bible characters and the Bible authors to describe the Christian life as a war? Why put it in militaristic um, wording or, or mi militaristic m metaphors even? Why do you think these characters, these, these Bible uh, people, they found it important to describe the Christian life as a war? And it becomes very clear as you read these texts, as you see what they're saying. For example, 2 Corinthians 10.4 tells us that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. You see, the followers of Jesus, we are involved in conflict. We are involved in a very real battle. In fact, if you're going to live for God, you can expect a war. You can expect combat. Am I wrong? I know that each one of you, each and every one of you, in your different contexts of life, in your, each envi in your very you know, own environment, I am positive that you can understand that life on this planet, especially if you want to live for God, it means war. It means a battle. Living for God is nothing less than constant battle. Jesus, and here's an interesting thing, Jesus, unlike many, many commanders and many masters, Jesus doesn't give us any illusion about this. He himself taught this. He never gave us, we are under no illusions regarding the journey we started under his command. The nature of the fight and the character of our enemy is outlined by, by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. For example, verse 1, Ephesians 6 verse 1, it tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So let me be very obvious here. Flesh and blood, we're not talking about a barbecue. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. The Apostle here isn't talking about food. And you'll be surprised at how some people can get that wrong. The apostle here, he's talking about everything that is human. Everything that we have to deal with day to day in our life. And he goes on to say, but against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces, our real fight goes beyond the human dimension. That's what he's saying. Our real battle, ultimately, our real battle, your real fight, your real enemy is not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's not the IRS. Someone would argue for that, right? It's not the IRS, it's not immigration. 
your real battle, your real fight, your real enemy is not against um, your children. It's not even against your mother-in-law. Your real enemy, he is beyond these human things, these, the, the human dimensions of life. Now, this places our struggles, this places our fights within the supernatural realm, not against flesh or blood. Your greatest enemy, like I said, it's nothing that has to do with what you battle day to day. Now, this really places our fight in a different perspective because frequently we like to blame the visible enemies. Don't, don't we? We're very, it's very difficult for us as humans to, to look beyond. Um, there's, a, there's a saying that says that we have to learn to see the enemy behind each temptation. And that's a very real truth. Sometimes we're tempted to be angry at our boss or at our spouse or at our children or at a teacher or someone like that when really the real enemy is beyond that, transcends that. Now, when we try to understand who this enemy is, it gets complicated because in the first place, our enemy He's unseen. He's an invisible enemy. And the enemy that we do not see is the most dangerous kind of enemy. Am I wrong? That that's stands to reason. That's, that's very logical. The enemy that you can't see, that's the worst kind of enemy because you don't know where the blow is going to come from. Our enemy is bigger than we know. He has uncountable masks and strategies. He can come into the fortress of the soul and divide people against themselves. Almost all of us, at one moment or another in life, we've been brainwashed by propagandas, slogans, mass thinking. You know, when it comes to human beings, it's very difficult for, at least in one moment of our life, for us not to have a twisted kind of thought. We think we're going the right way. Has this happened to you where maybe you, you've gone through a day, I'm that kind of person that at the end of the day when I lay my head down on the pillow, that's when I start, re, you know, like I have a recap of my day. That happened to you too? I lay down and I start thinking about what happened through the day. And sometimes I, I might have thought that I treated someone perfectly well, that I said the right thing at the right moment, but right then and there, at the end of the day, I see my mistake. Has that ever happened to you? You're like, oh my goodness, why did I say this? Why did I react this way? Why didn't I just be quiet? Or why didn't I just say this instead of this? It seems that our enemy, he has so many strategies and so many ways of confusing us and of twisting our, our trains of thought. Suppose, for example, that you want to urge someone. You want to... Um, you want to uh, support people or then at least tell people to live a modest, a simple lifestyle. Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? To live simply, a modest lifestyle and to live with simplicity? But you know, we've all seen so many movies or, 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 or propagandas, advertisements with Ferraris and Lamborghinis and with iPods. Yesterday, the, the, the new iPhone, iPhone 11 came out. I think it was yesterday. And there were already people in the line all night to get that phone. So how do you convince people to live a life of modesty, of simplicity, in a very materialistic, in a very capitalistic, consumerist world? With the huge shopping centers that are the temples of, of, consu of, of well, consumerism. How do you urge someone to live that life of, of simplicity? It's hard for us. You know, we get, um, there's, a, there's a principle in psychology that says, well, basically, it's, 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 I don't know how to translate it, but you buy something, let's say you buy the iPhone 11, all right, and you're happy with that for now, but then the iPhone 12 comes out, and suddenly that iPhone 11, that's perfectly fine that you still have from six months ago, what happens to it? It's old. It's bad. It's outdated. I need something new. I need the flashy thing. How do we urge people to live a life of simplicity and modesty in this kind of world? Or say that you want to urge someone to live a life of purity before God. Isn't, isn't Jesus the one that says, the pure of heart shall see God? The problem is, is that everywhere you look, there are so many, again, propagandas and movies and advertisements and books that teach us that the only interesting kind of sex is exactly and precisely the one outside of God's standards. It becomes very difficult for you to talk even about the value of, of marrying as a virgin, the value of virginity. People will laugh at you today. 
I've been laughed at before because of that. How do you teach people or how do you urge people to live that kind of lifestyle? How do you talk about peace, about being um, humble-hearted to a person that, have, that has accepted violence as the only way to settle differences? When we have been bombarded by slogans such as keep America strong or don't bargain with weakness or survival of the fittest. Ever heard that one? How do we talk about peace in that kind of world, in that kind of setting? You know, one of the enemy's main weapons are the tiny, conniving, and subtle ideas that invade the mind and subtly gain control. Ideas that quietly, and this isn't anything flashy, this isn't something that happens from one moment to the next. It's very slow, it's a slow process. And we are led to think that what is normal, that what is unnormal, is actually normal. What is uncommon is actually very common. And what is wrong, it's really right. And that's what we find happening in our world around us. How do we fight an enemy that is able to take control of the mind and put a per turn a person against him or herself? You see, sin, it's not only mysterious in its origin, it's mysterious in its nature. How do you explain something that turns someone to a point where he will do it or she will do exactly what hurts him or her and the people that they love? How do you explain something like that? You know, when it comes to parents, you ask any parent, they'll tell you that they'd give their life for their children. Am I wrong? You'd die for your kids. But at the same time, sin has a way of making you in a way that you don't see doing things or acting in certain ways living a certain life that is not beneficial to your children. That's the nature of sin. It's not mysterious only in, in its origin. It's also mysterious in its nature. There's no logical explanation for that. So the question is, what does God offer as a defense against all these enemies and such a formidable enemy? What does God offer to us so that we can defend ourselves? I want to remember you that if on one hand our struggle isn't against what is human, against flesh and blood, as said in Ephesians 6, we learn in 2 Corinthians 2, 4 that the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. So we don't count on our own strengths, our own capabilities. If you had to count on yourself, if you had to count on yourself to defend yourself against Satan, how would that go? Horribly. <laughs> We're just not strong enough. We're just not strong enough. When it comes to this, to this matter here, sometimes, and I've heard many Christians, and I'll, I'll admit something to you all. It's happened to me that I've grown very frustrated with the Christian life in some moments. It seems sometimes that I am simply too weak. I'm too alone. I'm too small, and on the other side, the enemy, he's just too big, too organized, too great for me to, for me to fight him off. And sometimes it seems that the Christian life, the Christian journey, it's hopeless. So if I am counting on my own strength, it is hopeless. There's nothing that I can do. I'm just a worm when it comes to this battle of titans but we are given God's armor for the protection, for our protection. And that's what the Bible offers us, an armor. So right here, um, we're going to analyze these items that God gives, that, that Paul describes here. We're going to al analyze these items. And when I was a child and I used to read this, this text, I used to think, well, why, why, is the, you know, why is the belt the truth? Why is the helmet salvation? Why couldn't the belt be salvation and the helmet be the truth? So why did the apostle describe each item in each virtue? And it makes sense when you stop to think about it. So that's what we're going to do right now. From verse 14 onwards, chapter 6, verse 14 onwards, we read that, we read, stand firm then with the belt, with the belt um, of truth buckled around your waist. Now this buckle of truth, um, and I, I, I really like getting into this, uh, the belt of truth, it's not, it's not like this belt that I'm wearing here. It's kind of like that. It was a very thick belt that protected the vital organs of the soldier. So it was a leather belt that was about an inch thick. It was very thick, and it would protect the soldier's vital organs. Um, and I used to think, well, why is the belt of truth described as protecting the soldier's um, vital organs. Why? Because the most powerful form of spiritual evil 
are lies. They're lies. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 14, we read that there was a battle in heaven, and, and you can quote this with me. There was a battle in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against, you know, Satan and his angels. But with his tail, the dragon took how many of the stars of heaven? A third. With his tail, the dragon swept away a third of the stars of heaven. Now, we know who the dragon is, right? The dragon is Satan. We know what the stars are, who the stars represent, the angels. What about the tail? What does his tail, the sweeping of his tail, represent? It's a lie. And there are lies about everything. In this world, there are lies about everything. There's a lie about happiness. There's a lie about family. There's a lie about success. There's a lie about prestige. There are lies about money. There are lies about education. There are lies about values and priorities in life. There are lies about God and religion. For every single person in this world, the enemy has a very neatly tailored lie. There's one for you and there's one for me. There are lies about everything. You see, people rarely choose evil for the sake of evil. Have you ever woken up one morning, one morning and said, you know what, today I'm going to be evil because I want to be evil. Is that how it works? Do you choose evil for the sake of evil? Or do you choose evil for the false representation that evil makes of what is good? People sin mostly. There are, there are some really special people out there that want to be bad. But usually we sin or we commit sin or we do something that's bad because we think it's good. We think that it's going to be good. There are lies about that too. People rarely choose evil for the sake of evil. So in this context, God offers the belt of truth to defend and protect our vital spiritual organs against the lies of the enemy. And right now, it, it would be interesting if you could maybe identify in your mind, and you know, you don't have to say it to anyone, you know what lies are for you. How has the enemy gotten a hold of you? What are the lies that are very easy for you to believe in life? God offers you the buckle of truth to defend and protect you against those lies. We have other parts of the armor from verses 14 through 17. We have the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. And if you notice, all of these weapons, all of these weapons are defensive items. God does not send us into this war empty-handed without giving us protection. The next one that we find is the breastplate of righteousness. We learn all through scripture that Jesus' righteousness becomes our righteousness. Do we not? We can be covered by his redeeming blood, which saves us from guilt, from anxiety, from despair, which um, we understand that covered by Jesus' blood, I can be redeemed. You know, Luther, the great reformer, Martin Luther, he, he used to say that he hated the word, sorry, he hated the word righteousness. Luther used to hate the word righteousness because in his mind, righteousness was not something that God offered. Righteousness was something that God demanded. It was a, a demand. You see, he had the idea that God needed you to be righteous on your own before you went to him. Now, let me ask you, who, who here can be righteous on his own? No one. I know I can't. And Luther struggled with this for a very long time. He didn't know how he could be righteous. And if there was someone that could be righteous by himself, it was this man. He used to fast. He used to beat himself up. Wanting to be righteous. Wanting to beat out of him de the devil, temptation, and sin. Later on, when Luther understood through reading scripture, texts, for example, such as, uh, I believe it's Psalm chapter 70 or 73 that says, save me in your righteousness. Luther, he started reading these texts and he started to understand that, well, well how, what does God, what does David here mean, save me in your righteousness? How does God save through righteousness? And so he started studying more and more texts and he started to understand that righteousness is not a demand. It's a gift. It's an offer. It's not primarily what God demands of me. It's primarily what he offers me. It's what he wants to give me. And after that comprehension, we know that Luther went on to be the great reformer that he was. So the breastplate of righteousness teaches me that I can cover myself, I can cover my body with his righteousness. When God looks at me in the judgment day, in the judgment moment, he won't see me, he will see Jesus and his righteousness. That's what we mean when we talk about righteousness by faith. 
right? My righteousness is actually his, but it's not something that he demands. It's something that he offers. The next item that we find are the sandals of peace. Now, I want you to try to imagine you know, you've seen, I, I bet you've all seen some, some Roman-esque movies, you know, from the Roman Empire. And you can imagine the, the Roman soldier with, uh, uh, the Roman soldier with, with, you know, that helmet and the whole body of armor and the shield and the sword. But imagine him without the sandals. Imagine him barefooted. Would that work? Would he be able to fight effectively? Of course not, because during the battle, during the battle, he would be all the time looking down, seeing if he's stepping on, you know, maybe some broken metal or maybe a, a piece of wood or maybe, you know, a fallen sword. He wouldn't be able to fight very well. So the sandals as the preparation of peace, the sandals of the preparation of peace, they, uh, they play a very important, vital role in our Christian journey. In a war, a soldier cannot walk barefooted. The gospel is God's assurance that we do not have to become discouraged. We are not striving, my friends, to win a battle. We're not striving to achieve victory. You know why? And this might be a surprise to many. Well, what do you mean? I'm not, I'm not fighting to, to win? No, because the victory is already yours. Jesus already won the war. The battle, the war, it's already over with. Satan is a fallen enemy. He is a defeated loser. And Jesus is the winner. We were, we were in, uh, in Israel, and uh, for Vespers Friday night, um, one of the songs that they sang was this song sung in, uh, it, it's sung a lot in the Philippines, I, it's what I heard, and it says that Jesus is the winner man. Has anyone in here ever heard that song? Jesus is the winner man. And basically, Jesus is the winner. Jesus is victorious. I don't leave every morning to win a battle because if I believe in his righteousness, if I, if I believe that the, the battle is already mine, I'm not fighting for that. There are battles here in the world. You will fight, but you can be sure that victory is already yours. So the sandals of the gospel of peace, it not only brings you peace and a peace that the world cannot understand, not only this, but it should transform you into a peace bearer a maker of peace. Now, and, and I know that here, I, I don't want to lose any friends here, okay? I don't want to lose any friends, but my dear friend, if you are not a peace bearer, a peacemaker, wherever you go, you know, before I get to that part, have you ever been somewhere or been around someone that it seems that they don't have to say anything, only their presence, it, it, it kind of soothes the environment? It kind of, gives you peace. I've been around people like that. My wife, for example. To me, my wife, she, she is peace in person. She's so tranquil, you know, and so, so kind and nice. And there's some people like that in the world, you know, that you feel, I'll tell you someone else, Jeff. Jeff, you're at church, and I got to know him a little bit better at the Campery. My goodness, what a good man. You're around him, and you're always laughing, and he's always happy and, and well-humored, you know, and it's good to be around people like that, isn't it? The gospel should change us. It should transform us into bearers of peace. Wherever you go, be that in a, in a, in a, in a chaotic environment at work or at school or at home, in a divided family, in a divided, divided work environment, we should be bearers of peace. And if we're not, my dear friends, something is wrong in our comprehension of the gospel. If you are not bringing peace to the place that you're at, Something is wrong in the way that you're understanding the gospel. Even Jesus, when he was suffering the horrors of, you know, that, la that last weekend and Friday and, you know, being beaten and, and a crown of thorns on his head and all that happening, Jesus, the well, Spirit of Prophecy tells us that when you looked at him as his semblance, it was of peace. We can be peace bearers. We're not talking only about a pathfinder ideal here. We're talking about a very real truth that we have to live. The sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have to understand this truth, this reality. The next item that we find is the shield of faith. The word that Paul uses here, in many movies you'll see that the Roman soldier, he would use this, this small round shield. Have you ever seen that? That's not what the apostle is talking about here. He's talking about the centurion's tower shield. It was this this, this huge, um, it was this huge oblong-shaped shield. And one of the most um, dangerous 
weapons, one of the most dangerous things that could happen in war was the fiery dart or the fiery arrow because you don't know where it's coming from. It might be coming from above or from the side or from left, from right. You don't know where it's coming from. So due to that danger, they had this huge shield that could, because of its mobility, it could defend the soldier on each side. And so you've probably seen this in movies, but the, sol the soldiers, they would hold the shield like this and they would defend their half and the, the right side of their left um, the, the soldier on the left. And the soldier on the right side, he would defend half of him and your, your right side. So this shield of faith is, is described here as defending us from the fiery darts of temptation, the fiery darts of the, of the enemy. And the reason for that is because faith can deal with the darts of temptation. But you see, for Paul in the Bible, faith is never, never something abstract. To many people that you ask, they, they treat faith as though faith were something... Um, um, it was something subjective. You know, it, it wasn't something very real. Some people treat faith as, this, as a spiritual gift in the sense where, you know, some people have it and some people don't. So I've heard people say, you know what, this, this whole faith thing, it's not for me. Let me, I'll, I'll return my tithes. Um, I'll help out in potluck. I can even preach or, or do, you know, the tithes and offerings moment. I can uh, sing up front. But, you know, this whole faith thing, that's not really for me. I'll leave that to the elders. I'll leave that to those, you know, older ladies that have very calloused knees because they pray all day long. Is that how faith works? No. Faith is a necessity. When it comes to our Christian journey, faith is a necessity. I've heard many people say, you know what, I have a lot of faith. That's not how it works either. You see, faith isn't measured by its size, but by its foundation. You can have faith in a lot of things. I can have faith in money. I can have faith in success. I can have faith in family. I can have faith in a relationship. There are many people there who place their, their spouse or their parents in, in this, tr as a trophy or, or as, you know, on this pedestal where that person is, is almost God to them. No one can live up to that all the time. I would hate it if anyone did that to me because I'd be constantly disappointing them. Faith does, is not measured by its size, but by its foundation. What do you have faith in? Or whom do you have faith in? When you go to the chapter of faith by excellence in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, 38, look at what we find here. By faith, the heroes described here conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames. They escaped the edge of the sword. Weakness was turned to strength. By faith, men became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. By faith, they were able to endure persecution, suffering in prison, and death. Look, many times we talk about faith as if it were something abstract. Now, is this abstract? Is this here something subjective, what we just read, or absolutely tangible and practical? These are real things. They battled, they fought through faith. Mouths of lions were shut. Women received their dead. These are real things. These are very day-to-day -day practical. Well, not receiving your, your dead back, that's not day-to-day. -day. But that, these are very practical things. Faith was meant to be real. You have to feel it. You have to know it. You have to be assured of it. How can I have a relationship with God if I don't believe that he exists? Isn't that what the text in Hebrews says? We may seek small victories by faith, but we know that the battle has already been won. That's the beauty of faith. The last defensive item that we find is the helmet of salvation. And uh, I really love this one. You know, um, when I was younger, and I told you guys this uh, in my first sermon here, I, before I, I truly converted to God, I used to be a, a semi-professional MMA and kung fu fighter. So I would fight in championships. That was actually my life. I would train in, in championship season, in, in competition season, I'd, I'd train eight hours a day. That was my life. And um, you learn a lot of, of, of lessons when it comes to, uh, to life. You learn a lot of lessons in the ring. And uh, one of those lessons was this. You can take kicks and punches to your legs, to your stomach, to your sides, to your back, to your arms, and continue standing up. But if you take one blow to the head, one very nicely placed blow to the head, you can be as strong as you want, you're gonna go down. 
The helmet of salvation, it's not the helmet of salvation by chance. You see, the helmet obviously was very essential to protect the head of the body, the most vulnerable place of the body. The helmet of salvation means that we are protected from doubts about who we are, to whom we belong to, and where our final home shall be. Let me explain it a little bit better. Far too often, the world sends us negative messages. Maybe your boss comes in one day and he chews you out. And by the implication of what he's saying, not only are, a, are you a bad employee, but you are a bad father or mother. You're a bad um, sibling. You're a bad son or daughter. You're a bad person. And when you have these messages coming constantly to you, you're bad at this, you're not worth anything, you are horrible. You know, never before in the history of mankind have we had so many um, psychological diseases. We're talking about yellow September. Has anyone heard of that, yellow September? No one? Yellow September? So, so sometimes months are... are categorized in color, and they bring awareness for different things. Yellow September is bringing awareness for suicide, right? So never before in the history of mankind have we had so many mind illnesses, people who have depression and people who, who uh, uh, you know, have different um, categories of depression. Never before. When the world rains down blows on us that we are worthless, that we have no value, that we are bad at this and bad of that, the helmet of salvation wards off those blows. Because the helmet of salvation gives me the assurance that I am valuable. That I am worthwhile at least to God. That he gave himself for me. Through the gift of salvation, we know that God loves us to the point where he gave his only son. You know, in the gift of Christ, no one can say that more could have been done. No one can say that. We know that Jesus, he not only came to this world, but he lived our life, he shed our tears, he shed our blood, he suffered our pains, he lost our losses, and in the end, he died our death. All in this to show us that the, the price tag that we sometimes think we have to merit, it's already ours. We are already that valuable. There's a basic law of psychology that says, and pay attention, this law says that you are what you think that the most important person to you thinks that you are. Did that make sense? Again, you are what you think that the most important person to you thinks about you. You are what you think that the most important person to you thinks about you. It's not what he actually thinks, it's what you think that he thinks. So the real question here is, who is the most important person to you? If it is a spouse or parents, or children, or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, rest assured that that person will let you down at some time. The most important person to a Christian, who does it have to be? Christ. And you know what he thinks about you. He thinks the world about you. He thinks the world about you. So the helmet of salvation is our assurance that we are indeed valuable. He does love us to the point where he gave himself up for us. Now, at the end of this description, after describing the weapons of defense, the apostle mentions the only offensive power, and this is in verse 17, where he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You see, God will not allow us to go into battle, to go into war empty-handed. He won't. We're going to go with something in our hand. For the offensive capability that he gives us, we have the sword of truth. Those are where the weapons of defense, and now we have the sword of the spirit. I'm sorry, the sword of the spirit. Now, I, I really believe that the sword of spirit, it walks hand in hand with the belt buckle of truth. For where the truth, the buckle of truth defends us from lies, the sword of the word, the sword of the spirit, it penetrates with God's truth. So these are two items that walk hand in hand. Actually, all of them walk hand in hand, but I really think that these two are very close together. Now, what can a word do? Ultimately, what can words do? But what's more, this sword, at the end of the day, this sword, it's nothing more than words. What can mere words do in such a conflict? Well, it depends. If we're talking about our words, if I'm talking about my words, you know, there's a saying that says words are wind. Have you heard that? Words are wind. 
And it, when it comes to human words, that's true because I'll say something to you right here and maybe tomorrow it'll change and, you know, show me broken promises. So if the words that we're talking about are human words, then they truly are indeed worthless, not worth very much. But here we're not talking about human words. We're, the sword here is the powerful word of God. The same power used to create light, the stars, the waters, the forces of nature, the very words used to create the existence of everything that we can imagine and even those that we cannot imagine. These are no ordinary words. They're the same words that Jesus used in the, in the desert of temptation while he was battling against the devil. They're the simple yet powerful and affected, effective, thus, thus says the Lord. But it, it is written. You know, in her last assembly in 1909, a very old and frail Ellen White, she went up and she held up her big old Bible and she said something very, very beautiful. She said, I recommend to you this book. The Spirit gives you words to say when you do not know what to say. Life in the Spirit of God is a life of prayer, a life of study of God's written word in the Bible. It becomes a spiritual weapon to push back the powers of darkness and defeat them. And that's found in letter 105. In the Christian life, preparation is essential. It's essential. As my mom used to tell me when I was a, you know, a little child, a little kid, she used to say the army, and she was talking about health, the army that you feed the best is going to have the best chance of winning. So if you eat your broccoli and your green beans, your white blood cells, what's going to happen? They'll be strong. Your immune system will be, will be strong. But, you know, if you only eat candy and you only eat, you know, chocolate, you're going to be weak. You're feeding the wrong army. It's the same for children. It's the same for Christians. The side that you are feeding will win. No, it's not for no reason that we talk about reading the Bible, that we talk about spending time in prayer and knowing God. Because ultimately, my dear friend, your salvation is hinged upon your relationship with him. And your defeat and destruction is hinged upon you putting on that armor. So pray to God day by day that he will place upon you, he will grant you these defensive and offensive weapons so that you can stand as a good soldier of truth. Not only for yourself, not only for your family, but because we are going through the last moments of history here on planet Earth. In Portuguese, we have a song that says, I can hear the, footstep, the footsteps of a God that, that grows near, that comes nearer. We can already hear his footsteps. We're on the edge of history. Put on your armor. Be a strong soldier. And may God bless you. We're going to sing the song right now, Onward Christian Soldiers. I hope no one, no one fights with me because of that song today here. But as you sing this song, please sing with enthusiasm, with strength, and with the power of a soldier of Christ.
we come to you this moment and we thank you, Father, because you made the preparation for us, Lord, in the Bible, showing us that this life that we live as followers of Jesus is a life of combat. You did not delude us or lie to us about that. You were very upfront about, about that. And Lord, as in any battle, Father, we become very weary, we become tired we become scared sometimes and frustrated and discouraged, Lord, because sometimes we, like Peter, take our eyes off you and then we look at the world around us. We see the strength of the enemy, how big he is and how small we are, and we start to sink. But Father, you have given us an armor and we ask you, Lord, we plead, please don us with that armor. Father, please give us the belt of truth so that we can defend ourselves and be protected against the lies of the enemy. We know that there are lies out there for everyone. Please protect us with the truth, Lord, and set us free as you promised you would. Lord, please give us the breastplate of righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, his merits, not ours. Help us put on this armor, this breastplate, day by day, Lord, and be sure, certain, that we are accepted before your throne through the merits of Jesus Christ. Lord, please help us put on the sandals of the gospel of peace. Lord, we not only want to have peace, but we want to bring peace to a world in chaos, a world in war. Wherever we go, Lord, be that at home or at work or at school, Lord, please, Lord, help us be peacemakers and peace bearers everywhere we go. Let people see that we have this, this joy inside of us because we know God. We know you. We know Jesus. Lord, please help us always put forth the shield of faith. Lord, we know that this shield, it really doesn't matter how big it is. Faith isn't measured by its size. Lord, we know that it's measured by its foundation. And you have to be that rock. Lord, please grow our faith in you. Grow our relationship with you so that we can walk side by side, walk day by day, learning from you and knowing you, Lord, so that when that perfect day comes and you come back, we won't be surprised by someone that we don't know and that doesn't know us. Lord, thank you for the helmet of salvation. When we, when we have all the messages that come bombarding our mind, Lord, telling us that we are worthless, telling us that, we, that no one cares about us and that tells us that we, are, we have no value Lord, thank you for this helmet that protects and shields our mind and shows us and teaches us day by day that eternal value was spilt for us. That we, because of that, we are, we are priceless. Help us truly live as sons and daughters of God. Lord, please help us wield that sword, the sword of the Spirit. Help us penetrate this world with truth, Lord. Help us, wherever we go, cut down and tear down the lies of the enemy with the sword of truth. And we know, Lord, that you are the word. You are that sword. You are the sword of the word. Help us know you also, Lord, in that. Bless each person here, each family that is represented here, each man, each woman, each child, each boy and girl, Lord. Please teach them day by day to be good soldiers of the cross. I ask you these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ.